Okay, so we discussed Occam's razor. Pick your model carefully. In other words, a simpler hypothesis set is better. And then we discussed sampling bias. Make sure that your training bin and your testing bin are the same. If they're not the same, some kind of sampling bias is present. Now, you know, when they're sampling bias, all bets are off. Anything could happen. You could be okay, like in the credit application, if you know you have enough data around the boundary. But more often than not, it's a complete and utter disaster. We just have no way of knowing what can happen when there's sampling bias in the data. And all conclusions that come from data that's you know sampling biased, you know, I distrust them, you know, without any reservations. Okay. Now let's talk about data snooping. Data snoop, literally, it's sort of trying to get a subtle peek at the data in order to make some subtle choices and you, you know, so that you know, what, what, what will happen when you get the data looks great and you think you've gotten away with it, but you have not. Okay? You cannot get away with data snooping. Now, let's sort of, you know, form, formulate data snooping in a little bit more precise way. Okay? And, and to, do, to do so, we have to sort of, you know, re-examine why we have data. Why is data so fundamental to machine learning from data? Okay. And data really has two purposes. The first is to learn from, or the second is to assess. And the data snooping is usually occurring when these two get irretrievably mixed together and you, know, and, 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 and you think that your assessment is good, but it's not. Okay. Now let's summarize this in a principle. Okay. If the data has affected any step, any choice in the learning process, then the data cannot be trusted in assessing the outcome of that process. Okay, so I'm going to repeat it because this is a very, very important, you know, principle. So the data is, because we use the data for learning, you know, if effectively that means that we use the data to make some choices. For example, choosing the hypothesis, the final hypothesis from the hypothesis set. Okay. So that's the data being used for learning. It affects the choices we make. Okay. And now we come around, and we only have one data set. Now we come around from the other perspective and say, you know, we are interested in E out. So can we use the data to assess the performance of the final hypothesis? But because the data affected the process that generated the final hypothesis, you know, when you use the data again, it's now contaminated data. Okay. And so it's not trustworthy in assessing the performance of the final hypothesis that the data itself generated. Okay. And in order to make the data, you know, reliable in assessing the outcome of the learning. That's why we had to go through all that hard theory that linked the performance of, of the final hypothesis on the data that was used to generate the final hypothesis. That's why we needed all that hard theory. Okay. Now, if you do really want a trustworthy, unbiased assessment of the performance, if you really do want to assess the performance of the final hypothesis, you have to estimate the performance on a completely uncontaminated test set. So that's the operational principle that comes up from the data snooping principle. Okay. So that means that you know whenever you whenever you are thinking that you're going to assess your performance on a test set, you have to lock that test set in a vault, and that test set must not affect any choice in the learning process. Okay. Now, you know, there is one choice in the learning process that the data has to affect, which is the choice of your final hypothesis from your hypothesis set. Okay. And we can account for that choice by making sure that you pick the, the hypothesis set before you look at the data. And that was the reason for that very important principle. You always, always, always must choose your hypothesis set before you look at the data. Okay, let me now, you know, that, that's the principle. It's a relatively simple principle, but it's very easy to, you know, violate this principle. Let me show you an example, okay, and it's a puzzle. So, you know, if you go back, let's say, to 1985, you know, when we, when we had all this nice financial data, and there was the S&P 500, you know, we, today we have what's called the S&P 500, so we can look at the stocks in the S&P 500, there's Apple, Google, you know, IBM, and so on and so forth. So you take this 500 set of, this set of 500 stocks, and we go back to 1985, and we see how did these stocks perform, and wow, you know, you get 16.2% annualized return. Okay. Now, for those of you who are not interested in finance, you know, get interested in finance because after you become a machine learning guy, you're going to go out and make lots of money and then put it in the stock market. And if you can get 16.2% return, wow, bingo, bam, wham, you will be retiring in style. Okay. Well, I have news for you. The 16.2% return is actually something that's not realizable. Okay. The actual return of the S&P uh, 500 from 1985 to 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 basically some, some, sometime around now is approximately, you know, 8.3%. Okay. 
So what is this, you know, factor of two difference in retail? That's a big factor. And that, and that shows you, you know, the impacts that things like sampling bias and data snooping can have. Okay. So now, let me tell you actually what we did wrong here in this red curve. Okay. So we took today's, you know, S&P 500. Now, and then we looked at how did today's S&P 500 perform over the last, you know, you know, whatever, 25, 30 odd years. Okay. So first of all, there's sampling bias. Okay. Sampling bias because we didn't pick a random set of stocks in 1985 to see how they perform. Okay. So that would be a way to test whether putting money in the stock market is a good idea or not. Okay. But even worse, okay. the, the, the nature of the sampling bias, so how we filtered stocks into our you know, portfolio to, to, to look at what in, included a very serious flaw, which is data snooping. So, you know, we took today's S&P 500 and then we tested today's S&P 500 on, on, on the data from 1985 to 2015, let's say, or 2016. Okay. But, you know, how did we determine today's S&P 500? It is on their performance, on the stock's performance on that very data. So the very data that we're going to test, that we're going to evaluate today's S&P 500 was the data that was used in selecting today's S&P 500. That's data snooping. The data has affected what stocks we choose and it's also going to be now used to assess the stocks we chose. Whenever you use a data set in this dual role to affect the choices leading up to your, to your final hypothesis and then also to assess the final hypothesis, watch out. Data, ideally should only perform one or other of those roles. Okay. And if you're going to use data to perform both roles, you need to know about it and you need to take it into account when you assess. Okay. Now, let me tell you that data snooping is very subtle. It occurs in very many ways. It occurs, you know, usually it occurs innocently. It's not, you know, with malice that you do it. But then when you do it, boy, things look so great. Look at the 16.2% return. Things look so great that you don't think about it. You just think, oh, wow, I've succeeded. I'm such a good machine learner. Okay. But then when you go and deploy this thing, you find, oh, no, it's not getting me 16.2% return. The S&P 500 is getting me 8% return. Now, in this case, it's not a disaster. It could have been negative 8% return. Okay. So in this case, it's not a disaster. But we just don't know what could happen when there's data snooping. Now, let me show you, you know, examples of this very subtle you know, kind of happy hell that you could be in where you think things are great, but it's actually hell.